I'm David Pomerantz and welcome to Song Sessions, where in the weeks and months to come, you'll meet some of the most brilliant songwriting artists of our time or any time. I've spent most of my life singing and making records and writing songs. And given the subject of songwriting being one of my very favorite things to talk about, I thought it would be really cool if we could have uh, some of my friends and collaborators and songwriting heroes sit down and talk shop together about song. So here we are. Today, we have someone who, to me, exemplifies all the best qualities in an artist. Dedication, high craft, and a very interesting and unique way of making people feel emotionally. This person does this better than almost anyone I know. Uh, you know her as a brilliant songwriter and a recording artist with tons of major successes through the years. Uh, claimed solo albums, number one charted compositions like Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady by Ellen Reddy, and uh, songs in films and TV, stacks of awards, and so much more. And really excited. We'll talk about more of that as we go, of course. But the real reason I'm excited to share this time with her is because she's one of the coolest people I know. <laughs> and uh, Harriet and her work are timeless. So welcome to... Harriet Shock. Hi, Harriet. Hi, David. Thank you so much for that. Well, you're, I'm such a fan of you. Uh, you <laughs> Back know. at you, you know. Well, thank you. I mean, even if I didn't know you, I, you know, I'd want to know you because uh, you're so awesome. Um, I'm going to just jump in with a few questions. I'm very interested in your process and how you write uh, because you do do that thing that I was talking about. You actually can reach into someone's emotions and and pull out, you can actually tell the truth about a situation in, in a way I see very few people, few writers being able to do. I have a question. So um, a lot of writers go after the hit. They sit down, I'm going to write a hit song, I want to write a successful song or a song I can hear on the radio and such. But uh, I sense when I listen to your stuff that even though you've had hits, that you don't do that. So... Um, my question to you, first of all, is it a struggle to uh, to find the truth in something? Do you do you suffer at all when you write and as you as you look for the right thing to say and and that sort of thing? Well, that's a really good question. I actually don't feel inspired to write until the truth of the situation has hit me. It's usually uh, I know David Wilcox used to say he wrote from really realizations and that's sort of mine if I have an epiphany about something or if something really moves me that's what makes me write a song in the first place so I'm not looking for the truth unless it's a confusing situation which sometimes writing a song will help me solve the confusion of wow. and then I find the truth in the process of writing Interesting. So, and and are you, when that inspire, inspiration hits you, are you in bed at night? Are you are you a disciplined writer in terms of the nine to five of it? Do you punch a clock and then oh, no. for something to happen? No, I, I should write more than I do. But when something hits me, I could be anywhere, you know, and I've got to write it. I may write down a lyric like I did in Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady. I was on a plane and I wrote the first verse and first line with the chorus. But I usually go to the piano first. And that strangely was not how that happened. So 30 years later, I looked back and thought, maybe I should start with lyric. <laughs> but um, whenever I see a, a situation, I, I write from the truth of it hopefully, because I figure if it moved me that much, it might move someone else. But I'm not writing for them, I have to say. I am communicating something real to a real person. Wow. Well, that was going to be a question I was going to ask you, and you've answered it beautifully. You write it to the point where it moves you. Yeah, well, I, I'll say this. If it doesn't move me, I don't start writing it, I think. Right. When you take on something like that, you're inspired to do it and four lines come out and they're awesome and you're excited and they're true, but it stops. What then? 
music then <laughs> because the music will take me there because um, the first few lines will inspire the music and then the music starts going and what I want to say usually follows. Of course, yeah. there's second verse that you have to write to the same music. So I, I think about the whole situation and what more I want to say. And sometimes it's a few days later, I realize, oh, you know, like the song for my sister, I didn't get until a year later, the very end of, of every oh. chorus. So, wow. yeah. Wow. And so it, you don't map it out. Uh, I know that I know Sondheim, for instance, well, he's got a, a different uh, way of doing it where he'll take a, a song. He's got to go from this point to that point, And this data has to be in it. And he maps it through and then he fills it in with the specific. And so, but do you sort, so you sort of let it hit you and let it take you. Yeah. If I'm writing a song that I'm writing for me, that's something I want to say, yes. But if I'm writing for a film or a musical, yeah. I pretty much know where I want to go. And mapping is a good thing. I have my students do it, but I usually, it, it goes on its own, you know, <laughs> like yes, a I do. Yes. I understand. I hear tell, I don't know if this is true, but that Neil Simon, the playwright, um, apparently uh, starts to write at page one and writes linearly to the end. Well, I don't know that that's true, but I've heard it's true. And, uh, and I can, and then he edits later on. Yeah, I can dig it. I mean, he is Neil Simon and, uh, I think other people have tried to do that. It hadn't worked so well. <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> oh, you, you, you were raised in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, in a very musical family, your dad was a musician. Your aunt was a musician. Yeah. Tell, me, tell, me, um, tell us a little bit about that. What it was like well, being raised in that environment? Well, my father was a dermatologist who had put himself through medical school playing marimba and cello. Hmm. And he uh, would play the marimba and I would play the piano and we would do duets at home. And he showed me certain chords, you know, and I had the whole circle of this in my mind as a family. I was C, my parents were F, my grandparents were B flat. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but I could hear it. So when he would show me the chords on something, eventually I would say, I know, I know. And then we started doing duets. We had a very, you know, when you have music with a parent or a child, you have something very intimate that the non-musical parent doesn't share and so we had that bond uh, incredible are you traditionally trained or do you, are you tra by ear or what uh well i did take piano lessons and my poor music teacher thought i was reading but i would say why don't you play it one time so i'll see if i even want to play it you know and then i was sort of reading but you know i wasn't I really, you know. I, I did something similar <laughs> my person what was the name of your music teacher do you remember her name miss mary evans brown i remember one time she played da, 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 um da, 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 you know to see if i wanted to play it and i said oh full moon and empty arms and she looked at me and she said oh she clutched her pearls she said full moon and empty arms i've heard it all because she'd never heard that there were words to that you know, oh, she, there... <laughs> she was horrified oh that's too funny maybe I, well, I thought maybe she she knew with the song from a past life or something oh. like this but she just no. didn't know that there were words that's, that's not... right she was pretty upset that's amazing so so you you figured it out how to play and so you'd play with your dad. He'd play marimba and piano. And did you play like, what kind of songs did you play? Was oh, it like you know, great American songbook stuff? Or? Yeah. And he, you know, he grew up at a time when Darktown Strutter's Ball and Alexander's Ragtime Band, those songs, you know, oh, he yeah. would teach me. And so I loved all that. And I, you know, I grew up listening to Colt Porter and Rogers and Hart and all of that. So craft was real important to me. Right. Well, that's obvious that it is and that it was. <laughs> well, and so you listen to those guys and women, Cole Porter, Roger and Hammerstein, blah, blah, blah. And what 
so were they your heroes? Did they knock you out at a very young age? Did you go, in terms of songwriting now, obviously. You know, I, I was These, go ahead. Right, I wasn't as aware of who the songwriters were, but at the grocery store, they would have like Ella Fitzgerald sings Rogers and Hart. So I heard all those songs. Actually, Hart more than Hammerstein, no offense. But anyway, um, and so all, and Cole Porter and all that internal rhyming and everything, I loved that. And, and Ella sang the intros too. Yes, she did. Uh, you know, old Peter Minuet had nothing to do with that, you know. So uh, I loved the writing, but I wasn't as aware that it was the songwriters doing that. I was so young, you know, I just, oh, I thought, Ella, oh, that's wonderful. Ella sings those really good songs. Wait, how old were you then? I, I don't know, high, near high, you know. <laughs> so you were a kid, a, a little, yeah. little kid. Oh, I got you. I got you. When did you decide that? Was there a moment where you decided that this was for me? I'm going to write songs or... And what was your first song? What did you write? What did you try? <laughs> I did. I, I was best friends with a girl at this girl's school I went to who had a governess. And she wouldn't take us to the movie and we would like torture her with like... <laughs> over and over until she said, all right, you know. So my first song was actually something in those days that I don't, I barely even remember anything about it. But I thought, oh, I can put words and music together and play it on the piano. <laughs> it never occurred to me to do that for a living until later in college when I wrote and performed in these skits that we had, which were... Um, Okay, uh, shoot me now. I was in a sorority, okay? <laughs> but I needed that because I went from a tiny girl's school to a huge university of Texas, so I needed some smaller group to be in. So we were competing against other sororities, and both times I wrote it, we won. And I Whoa. thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to do this for a living? But, of course, no one does that. <laughs> And they so you would write you'd write a little playlet or would you write just a song yeah. or no all the songs and the play and everything Whoa. else it's ridiculous and that's what I wanted to grow up and do is write musicals ah uh, and and do you write book for musicals do you write scripts is that part of what you love to do well I started okay when I first came out here I wanted to be a script writer so I studied with Sid Field and I know where plot point one comes and every time I watch a movie with my husband I say it's page 20 look what happened wow. but um, I only wrote one musical book and and songs and it was a jukebox musical of a bunch of my songs it was put on a few times oh, wow. uh, it was called split but otherwise split. Split. Yeah, I usually don't write the book. If I'm writing a musical, I usually write it like with Misha Siegel writing the music. I just write the words. It's so much easier. Oh, I understand. I understand. <laughs> We're, I'd like to talk about that with you later, uh, about plays, because that's a whole other world, isn't it? Mm. Whole other universe in terms of a songwriter. Okay, so I've, here's some more questions. Okay. So you told me about, so you're, so you're singing heroes. So when you heard uh, Ella, at the at the store, singing Rogers and Hart. Um, did you then start to get into other singers? Let's talk about singing just for a second, because you're a yeah. wonderful singer. So, what what singers aside from Ella, through your early life, inspired you? Ray Charles is my inspiration for everything, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. He's it. But I also, of course, loved Frank Sinatra and still do. I just think he is the most charismatic singer I think I've ever heard. But when Ray Charles opens his mouth, I'm just gone, you know. Boy, that's true, eh? She's, he's completely Ray Charles. Yeah. There is nothing like Ray Charles, no one like Ray Charles. And he kind of seems to get into the heart and into the chest of the listener, at least for me. Uh huh. And and really makes uh, something happen that's very special, very emotional and special. Yeah. Ray Charles. Good. And what about songwriting? 
Well, um, of course, I was raised on all the classics, but then when I discovered Don Henley and Paul Simon and Joni Mitchell and right. um, Bob Dylan and those people, I just, that was a whole other thing, you know. Um, I thought, I want the freedom to do all of that. It, it's so different from what I was brought up on, you know. Is that, is that because it was more literary than the pop songs of the, those past times? And no, it was just, um, look at Bob Dylan. He can just, you know, list everything he's seen on the street and make it a song. You know, I mean, right. that, that's freedom. But And then Joni Mitchell can just do anything with her voice and melody she chooses to. And the words are just like, try, I mean, they study her lyrics in poetry class now in college, and they should. And so... So when I heard these people and Carol King, of course, which, uh, which I I was proud to be compared to, only because we had the same publisher and we were piano female singer songwriters, and I, I met her and she was very kind. But um, you know, these people had a huge effect on me. So it's hard to say. You know, the brain is a bit of a computer, and I took all that in. So who knows who really influenced me the most? But I just say Ray Charles because <laughs> that's how I feel. Yeah, no, I get it. He's the feeling man. So when did you, so the, the career thing. So you decided at some point, I'm going to try this now. Did you have yeah. enough? Did you stockpile songs? Did you have enough and go, you know, I'm going to take these songs and I'm going to make an album like blah, blah, like <laughs> Carol or whoever. Oh. I had a lot of songs before I ever made an album. I didn't do any of those other songs. They were awful. I thought they were really good. I took my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder into the office and played stuff for people you wouldn't believe. I mean, I've been here since the early 70s. So I was playing at a gay bar, which was the only place in those days you could play original material. And I had met a publisher at an ASCAP meeting. His name was Roger Gordon. And I told him where I was playing, and he said, okay, I'll come see you. He came there, and then I I had a few options. Also, um, Warner Brothers was talking to me, but I signed with Screen Gems, and then they made demos, and I made an album. But those songs were so much later than the songs I was just learning from. Uh, and luckily, I didn't get a deal until I had good songs because – I thought the first ones were wonderful, and I listen to them now, and I just laugh. I understand. Oh my God, <laughs> when you were still living at home, did you, when you'd come up with a, one of the some of the early songs, did you play it for your parents? Did you play it and say, "What do you think"? Or yes, or, but by the time I came out here, that's when I really started writing songs. I had only written a couple of songs in Dallas because I moved right. out here really early, and then every here, time by I the went, way is Los Angeles for this. Here is Los Angeles. Good. Every time I went home on a visit, I would make them sit there and listen to all my songs that I had written since the last visit, the poor things. So when my album, <laughs> my first album just finally came out, then they listened to that and the second one and the third one. They were all on 20th Century Records. And then I lost my parents. So the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh albums, they never heard. I see. All right. And you were when you were 20th Century Records, you was with Russ Reagan, right? Yeah, he signed Russ, me. I loved him. Russ Reagan, I knew Russ as well. What a nice guy, right? Oh. What a decent, lovely person. Listen, I, I want to just spend a second and, and kind of commiserate with you about this because we kind of came up in a similar time. Um, there were people there who were that way. They were expert executives like Russ. Uh, I had one at Warner Chapel, Warner Brothers, called uh, Ed Silvers. Mm -hmm. There were there were those people. Erwin Robinson is another one who is still doing it. Yeah. And they were they headed publishing companies, they headed record companies, and they were delicious people. And they loved their artists. They loved them. Even Clive. Yeah. I was one of those people. So anyway, Russ is Russ certainly was one of those very nice people. And and did he did he um, correct or want to qualify what you were doing or did he just let you have at it well 
I did have a gatekeeper before I got to Russ. That was Roger Gordon. He would sometimes say, because he was my publisher. I had two different ones. And he would sometimes say, you know, this needs a bridge. And I'd go write one or something. But oh, good. Russ pretty much gave me free reign, yeah. Was Roger a songwriter? No, but... Um, he, had, he had instincts. He had very good instincts, yeah. That's a talent right there, right? Yeah. Well, his father was Matt Gordon. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Oh, yeah. You know, Chattanooga Choo Choo, uh, yeah. at last. So he knew he knew songs. Yeah, for sure. OK, so I have a couple more things for you. Are you ready for this? Yes, I am. See, I got a, I got I got a page here. I got pages <laughs> of things I want to know about you. OK, we've known each other a long time. Yes, we have. And, and I and I know you through your work and I know you obviously through your bio where people know about you. But there are specifics that I never knew. Here's one of them. Um, you were managed by a guy. You can <laughs> want to talk about this or not. It's OK with you. It's, his name was Bullets yeah. Durgum. Sounds like Al Capone. What, <laughs> what is he like to be managed? Listen, he 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 managed Jackie Gleason and Mer yeah. Griffin and Mort Saul. Oh, my God. What was that about? He was wonderful. What happened was I was managed by Roger Gordon for the first few years. And then Rudge Regan wanted me to have another manager. And he said, Jerry Weintraub or Bullets Durgum. Jerry Weintraub said, oh, OK, I don't have a white chick singer. And I was offended by that, like somebody that I would have been on tour with John Denver. But that's OK. So I said, OK, Bullets Durgum is my is my manager and he was adorable we couldn't walk down the street but everybody wasn't saying bullets hey bullets and he would go hi he didn't know who they were i mean everyone <laughs> and on the on the honeymooners that he's in the dialogue jackie gleason set, mentions him i nearly fainted oh my lord oh my lord did he smoke a cigar i want to know i don't think so you would think right. he would but no you would think he would okay so so with bullets and and then, so you did the, your albums with 20th Century, and then came, you did your recording of Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady. That was the first album, yeah, and Helen that heard was, it on the radio, yeah. And Helen heard it on the radio. Yeah. Interesting. Did she contact your publisher or you, or how did that happen? Um, I don't know. By then, it was sort of out there. It had been recorded by a group called LAX, which was... Um, a band and they didn't have a hit with it, but that had gotten some airplay. So then my version came out and there were two number, uh, you know, there were big radio stations like KNX and uh, something in San Diego. They were both poised to go on my version of it, which we had sped up because the music director really wanted it a little faster. For some reason, I think maybe because of the chemical alteration in his brain. But anyway, he wanted it sped up. So we recalled them all, sped them up. And the Friday before the Monday, these two top 40 stations were going on my record. He quit. So we oh. lost it. And the promotion man, you know, Paul Loveless, who was the head of promotion at 20th, is still talking about how could that have happened. You know. Anyway, so... They didn't play mine uh, on Top 40, but it got on the radio, like KNX FM that used to play album cuts. And sure, her, I remember KNX. Yeah, she heard, I guess, there or someplace else, and she decided to record it. And I guess she told the label to call Screen Gems or something. I don't know how it happened. But when she did record it, and it, and I got a call from her husband, manager, Jeff Wald, because I was in Dallas, my parents, uh, visiting them. And Jeff said, it looks like you have a hit because the radio stations went on the album cut that is your song. It was not the single, but they're forcing it out as a single. And I don't understand any of that. I just heard you have a hit. So that registered. Okay. But it was Helen's hit, no? Oh, yeah, I mean, it was you're... definitely. The, the, he just meant uh, they hadn't intended for that to be the single, but the radio stations kept playing. Oh, it. I see. I see. I see. Very, very good. And then, and then, so she had this monstrous number one hit record, right? 
Yeah. With your song. Can you can you play a few? I tell you what. Here's the deal. We, I've been talking to uh, a lot of my songwriter friends and friends in general of all ages, and it's remarkable to me uh, what people uh, don't know. Yeah. About the 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 venerable, classic, beautifully written standard songs of yesteryear and not so yesteryear. Yeah. In recent, right? So could you just play just a few bars of Ain't No Way to Treat a Lady, maybe the uh, the chorus or whatever you wish, so people will know it, remember? Well, it, it has a real short verse, so I'll do that Please, one. go ahead, play it. Yeah. I guess it was yourself you were involved. I would have sworn it was me I might have found out soon If you'd only let me close enough to see That ain't no way to treat a lady No way to treat your baby or woman your friend That ain't no treat a lady no way but maybe it's a way for us to end that's that i'm got tears in my eyes it's it's a beautiful a beautifully written thing um and how did you have yourself sing two parts there that's that's, <laughs> that's genius the way it i know it's amazing and it's you not doublers either it's andre rose green who always sings with me and she's oh, in the room she's wonderful yeah. thank you Andrea. hi andrea she's back there somewhere hi david hi honey hey so that's gorgeous was that a, a real story did somebody mistreat you and <laughs> take you for granted well it's on wikipedia so i guess i can tell you yeah i uh, i wrote it on an airplane as i was leaving someone for the last time oh <laughs> yeah you had done it before yeah, it was one of the last times I left him for the last time. So um, anyway, I started it, as I said, in the first verse and the first line of the chorus. And then I came back home and wrote the melody and the rest of it. But when I got to that interval, I thought, they'll never let me do that. That's classical music. <laughs> I mean, I actually had this voice in my head that said, you can't get away with that interval. I understand. But no one said anything. So No, because it, it was it was fresh to those new ears. And, <laughs> and well, in any event, it's it's so emotional. Ain't no way to treat a lot of no way. It's unusual. And that's it's the it's the magic of why these things happen, because they're just what they are. And and it, listen, it's you that that does it. You're the uh, chemist. Ah, it's gorgeous. Thanks. Um, okay. And then, so okay. Next question. Are you ready for this? I am. Everybody ready for this? Cause I'm having so much fun talking to you like this. <laughs> I am too. Yeah, this is so great. So, uh, so you had listen. So you got this number one hit. You've been a song. You've been a songwriter and a recording artist, and uh, and a successful one. And um, then your people start recording your songs. Uh, Roberta Flack, like, incredible. Uh, uh, Manfred Mann, yeah. Manfred Mann. I know, he did the title song of my first album, Hollywood Town. Unbelievable. Down, down in Hollywood Town. Mm -hmm. Your song. Yeah. I love that song. Uh, and uh, Johnny Mathis, what did he come No, He recorded something I had never recorded, uh, but... I had a, a record deal for a minute before 20th, and it was on Columbia, and Jack Gold signed me. But then there was a payola scandal, and all of his acts got dropped, and so I went to 20th. But anyway, I met Jack that way, and he heard my song, Ooh, What We Do, and recorded it with John Mathis, and it just came out on a re-release of a bunch of his stuff. I loved it. I got to sing it in the studio with him because he didn't know the vocal yet, and the oh, melody. Yeah. yeah, it was so great. What's it called? What's the name of it? 
It's called Ooh, What We Do. Ooh, we, what we do? Yeah, it, 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 it goes, Ooh, what we do, what we do, what we do, let's do it again. <laughs> Oh, dear Lord, hallelujah. And I had Hare Krishna, and then I had Oy Vey, but they made me take that out. And then, <laughs> amen, and oh, dear Lord, hallelujah, Hare Krishna, Oy Vey, amen. <laughs> oh, my God. It's pretty funny. But Johnny. You got them all in there. You got them all in there, all, I, all the I, references. I, yeah. Very good. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. That's incredible. So then, Misha, you met Misha Siegel. Who yeah. Was? An amazing composer, and uh, he, is. he is extraordinary. And then you guys wrote a bunch of stuff, and then you wrote something for uh, a movie called The Last Dragon. Right. Which is called First Time in a Ferris Wheel, which is an awesome song. Could you just play just a few bars of that? <laughs> there, people can know what that is. I love this song. How you please me. I think that this might be what I've been dreaming. What it is, but people call it love. I wonder if they really know. Like my first time on a Ferris wheel. There was really another verse there, but that's I didn't great. Know. It just opens up like the clouds. Over. First time on a Ferris wheel. Good. I know we weren't supposed to even. Uh, write a song for that movie and we didn't know it and someone at the company Suzanne Costa, Costa told us to write it and when we got to Mr. Gordy's house we said we had written a love song for the movie and he said there's no love song in this movie what are you talking about and so he played it and then at three in the morning he called the head of TriStar and said we're reshooting the end of the movie for this song Wow. And they did, and um, Smokey Robinson sang it. it. It isn't really a Smokey type song, but he he did a beautiful job. He did. But I heard it. It's gorgeous. How, Carl how... Anderson sang the original version, and that's just it for me. You know, with our buddy Gloria Gloria Loring, right? They did and Gloria together. Loring, absolutely. They uh, actually Carl sang it all the way through, but then when Gloria made her album, they had it on there as a duet. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. And so when you heard Smokey sing it, what did you feel? Were you in the, uh, the studio when he, he cut it? Um, not not the entire time, because he was there quite a while uh, doing this. But um, I, I love Smokey. I love his songs and everything else. But, you know, this was more of like a James Ingram type voice. And, and Carl Anderson had done such a definitive version of it. I, I would not want to be any singer trying to do that song after hearing Carl, although 35 s singers have done it. So, wow. I mean, not on record necessarily, but live. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. there, there's a performance at Carnegie Hall, you know, Carl and Nancy Wilson. Yeah, oh they gosh. did a beautiful job. And then Nancy went on and recorded it herself. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Nancy Wilson. Oh, baby. Yeah. Well, that's extraordinary. What was, what was it like working with Barry Gordy? What was that? For the people who don't know, Barry Gordy was the founder of and president of Motown Records. That whole Motown thing, all Everything. those bands, all those groups, Temptations, Four Tops, Stevie Wonder, all of them, Barry Gordy. So now Barry Gordy finds Harriet and Misha's song, first time on a Ferris wheel, and uh, cancels, changes the end of the movie to put it in there. <laughs> What was he well, like? We were signed to them. So we were writing for their stuff and everything. We were signed to Joe Bad, uh Snow Diamond, which is Motown's publishing arm. Oh, I see. Okay. It was wonderful working with him. I love him. He, he was just like, he knew exactly what he wanted. And he would sometimes tell you, and sometimes he'd just tell you, that's not it, you know. But he was great. Wow. And uh, I, I worked with a few people there, but just working directly with him was heavenly. Incredible. You know, I know I see on some of the uh, the compositions of uh, some of his writers uh, that his name appears as, as a writer. Do you know yep. any of the inside of that? Did he actually sit in those sessions and contribute? Uh... 
he was a songwriter first. He knew a lot about songwriting. So he was he was a real writer. He wasn't like one of those producers who puts his name on things. He oh, was. I, see. I never knew that. Oh, that's very yeah. interesting. Wow, I, that gives me a whole different view of the man mm -hmm. from that viewpoint. Yeah. Amazing. All right, my friend. So I'm I'm interested in your in the process of songwriting for you. Okay, so I have some a couple of questions for you. Uh, some maybe you've answered, so I may skip some. Um, uh, when you were writing, you're, who are you writing for? Is it you or the listener? I think we've got that. It's unless you want to say more about it. You well, are I, writing with with a with a rec receipt point, a, a recipient yeah. in mind. Yeah, the recipient is the person I'm speaking to in the song. Ah. Now, some songs, like about the people upstairs, I'm writing about them. Th that's a, a good thing to do sometimes in your catalog because most songs are written to a person and often there's some gripe you have that you're trying to get behavior changed or something. Yes. And I consider that you're in front of a jury and you're, you know, you're pulling out exhibit A and exhibit B and you want to <laughs> That's why I'm right. You know, but <laughs> wrong. occasionally it's good to just move into a he or she song about someone else you seem more interesting when you're interested in someone else mm -hmm. so um yeah but the recipient is usually the person i'm speaking to and is it always someone that you've known or is it a, sometimes an amalgamation of various someones you've known does that ever happen rarely i mean it's usually some real person i have something i really want to say something to you know like <laughs> like when i wrote this song mama for my mother and helen ready recorded it uh helen sang it she used to close her show with it and my mother went backstage and said i'm the mama that was written now, just in case you think it might be yours <laughs> no she didn't say that but she did say i'm the mom oh nice yeah nice so when you write these things uh, and you're sweating away to tell the truth. Oh, by the way, I've got to tell you something. This is very important about you in particular. Very okay. few people, very few people can get specific enough to move me. And I, I know you know that's a key to a great song versus an OK song. And um, in Nashville, they call it furniture, uh, you know, putting furniture in the scene. You know, where it's not just, you know, I love you, baby, but I love, I love the, the shadow on your nose when you say hello. Yeah. You know, picture, wham, Pictures. right? And, uh, and you do that. You're very specific. I, I'm going to ask you to play something very quickly. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a textbook um, example of this. And it's a song of yours called Over and Over and Over. And... Um, it's a story song that you are very careful to be specific about. And I, and I chill from note one to note 406, however many notes you've got in there, at how the story unfolds and how it goes off in my mind and, and affects me emotionally. So please play a bit of that song for us, for our friends here, and uh, share it with us, please. Over okay. And over and over. Thank you. This was written for my upstairs neighbors who were in their 90s. And um, I wrote it because uh, I went upstairs to visit them and I was so inspired by them that I wrote this song. And uh, they ha are no longer with us, but their daughter, Dorothy Elkinis, loves this song. And so I'm so happy I wrote it. And I would never have written it had I not been in their presence and been inspired by it. Looks like it's from the 50s Said that there's a cable in the back And he sits in his special chair Half awake and half aware That she is in the room somewhere That is his pivotal fact The photograph is clearly from the Smiling feet 
features of the bride and groom And my eyes fan from it to them It looks like her, it looks like him And the spark of love has not grown dim It lights up the room Headed where their parallel lines will finally meet He only sought to rule the world To lay it at her feet Over and over and over She steals his heart That is her And quick enough I sometimes go and take it up As if this long abiding love Were my holy grail Their bodies don't obey them In their sending of the game And yet the look inside their eyes Is constant and the same <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, the TV with a cable in the back is from the 50s, except that we didn't have a cable in the... Yeah, it's as specific as can be, and boy, that's a uh, that's a beautiful, true song. I see them. I see their age, and when they look, and, they, and you see after all this time, and they look at each other, it's still the same. Even in this inning of the game. Hey, yeah. That's... Fancy stuff. Well, very well done. Harriet. Thank you. There may not have been a cable in the back. I uh, I make a point in my book about saying truth is not fact. You know, you can change the facts to tell the truth. So <laughs> to 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 make the truth truth to, to illustrate more, the truth. Yeah, more furniture. You may not have seen the furniture, but you know there's furniture there. I got it. It helps you make the picture. I totally get it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let me talk about that for a second. You wrote a book called uh, Becoming Remarkable, which is about yeah. uh, your love for songwriting and stuff. I want to talk about your the teaching that you do in a minute. I, I'm not there yet. Is that okay? Okay, I just want to sure. put that over sure. here. But you did write this book called Becoming Remarkable. And well, uh, it was a, a series of 48 articles that I had written for songwriting publications, and someone decided to put it in a book in sections and someone edited it and the record label I was on at the time put it out in conjunction with my Rosebud CD. So oh, they, see. yeah, and the lyrics are uh, to that CD are in the back of the book. So they were in uh, cahoots. <laughs> I see. Well, you've been, uh, you've been an inspiration to a lot of writers. Well, while we're here, let's just talk about it. And I have more to more of your the juicy stuff as well but i'm going to read something i found this on the internet um and it's somebody who attends your classes you you do songwriting classes and and probably knowing you they're more like clinics or workshops where you kind of allow and empower and hopefully it's got to be like that or inspire yeah. others 
Um, but here's, here's what somebody said uh, about you. See, Harriet is a master teacher and one of the most precious and delightful human beings I know. She teaches the art of songwriting in an incredibly creative, supportive, entertaining, enjoyable, loving, and insightful way. Her classes are fun, safe, often deeply moving and transformative. Um, because she attracts highly creative and talented songwriters, as well as novices, there's always a lot to learn. Whether you've ever written a song before, or if you've written many, whether you sing, play an instrument, or consider yourself non-musical, this class is for you. And uh, that's somebody who's not just learning about songwriting. That's somebody who's like a better person for being in your class. Well, that's someone who's... Go on. I know who that is. Her name is Presence, and she's she's a wonderful person. But it is transformative in in magical ways because the students are communicating because I think songwriting is a communication. So once they start communicating into an area that has been not had any of that, as you know, it's like turning a light on. So I had a student who had not seen her children for 40 years. Her husband had taken them somewhere. And when she wrote a letter, a, a song to them, they found her through social security call it coincidence but it didn't happen until she wrote that song so and other things like that happen constantly but it's true you know communication is like a solvent and it just opens things up and magical things happen and so yeah people get transformed you know i have a very good friend who's a twin who had had trouble with her sister and she wrote a song to her and it made all the difference they they get along like mad now you know so. so communication is at the heart of that yeah and their willingness and they've got to be able to which is what you're helping them with too if yeah right. yeah and i'm also oh, making them do it they wouldn't have done it otherwise <laughs> right. you know they want to write a piece of fluff they don't want to write where the song is and that song is keeping all the others from coming out you might as well write it yeah i mean it's tough to do that i mean it's got to be you got to be a little bit brave right to, yeah to just to do to write over and over and over and go into that space or any of your others or the beautiful thing you wrote for your sister which i want to hear in a second a bit of, of um yeah when you actually land on something that's very personal uh, that can't always be a, a walk in the park or a pleasant thing to do. Exactly. Uh, do you have a philosophy about sticking in there and getting brave and not leaving till it's done? Yeah. Well, the way out is the way through. Yeah. And if you're if you're you know refuse to see the light at the end of the tunnel because you're still in the tunnel, you're never going to get to the light. <laughs> well, right, right. And if you and if you quit or come up short, people know it, right? I don't know if other people know it, but well, your creativity will be inhibited. <laughs> yeah, you'll know it. It's like, it would be like anything in life where you didn't quite do it and you know. Yeah. At least that. But I find, uh, I mean, I'd like to know this from you too. If you ever, and I have, uh, tried to cheat, and, and what I mean is uh, I've written, I've tried to write a song for, uh, for a record, you know, or for, uh, you know, uh, some, something generic. That'll sound great on the radio. Have, yeah. First of all, have you ever have you ever done that? Oh yeah, yeah. I've been signed to <laughs> publishers who wanted me to do you? that. <laughs> I have. You, you'll never hear those songs. Exactly right. Do they suck a little or suck a lot in your estimation and in other well, people's estimation? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, sometimes the music is so good. You can get away with sucking a little bit in the lyric, but I prefer <laughs> not to. But, you know, uh, you have collaborators who insist on putting stuff in there that you don't want your name on. I mean, you you know what it's like. Sure. Of course I do. But, uh, but yeah. But, okay. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't the only one. No. <laughs> <laughs> because, anyway. Now, so here. So, uh, now, there's this guy that came into your life. Uh, oh, maybe 25 years ago, Nick Vinay. And he was very inspiring to you for many reasons. 
I want to say just a little bit about him, and then I want you to gush about him. Tell me about Nick Finney and his in, in, his effect on you and your music uh, in those recent times. Yeah, um, I met Nick after he was a legend, having discovered all these people, you know, uh, Linda Ronstadt, the Beach Boys, Bobby Darren, Jim Croce, Lou right. Rawls. I mean, you know, and he made all these records with them. Yeah, yeah. then he, he and, produced Mac the Knight for Bobby Darren, right? Knight, yeah, right? they weren't giving credit then, but everybody knows he was the one who produced that record. Okay, and yes, okay. And so, yeah, when I met him, I met him uh, on the board of directors of Neris, the Grammys, and um, he had shown he had taught at us at ucla and had shown my record of i don't know he, he was aware of my first album let me just put it like that mm -hmm. and he was using it in teaching so when he met me he said he had always liked what i was doing but at the time i was writing mindless r b dance tunes i <laughs> talk about do you ever write things you're not thrilled with yeah because I had these guys living in my guest house and that's what they were writing. And I thought it sounded really good. So I was writing that. And he said, I, I want to hear songs that sound like you, that like mm -hmm. smell like you. And I'm thinking, who is this person? But as I started working with him, I realized I had gotten so far from who I really was that it was scary. Um, uh, I, I, if you stay away from who you really are as an artist long enough, you might forget. And I was almost at that point. So he made me write songs that were communications and things that I really felt. And wow, it, it was a huge difference between before and after. So he was a bit of a Spengali. He would send me a fax in the middle of the night in the, those days there were faxes and about, you know, Marlena Dietrich's funeral and how no one from Hollywood went to her funeral and all of that. And so then I would, it would inspire me to write a song. And he, he told me about Georgia O'Keefe and Alfred Stiglitz, how they were married and lived in separate houses. And that sounded ideal to me. Um, which, which you know, I'll, bring up, I'll bring up later because when, when my husband actually, uh, proposed I said does that mean we have to live together and he said not necessarily because I was like into that duplex thing to separate places but um so when Nick told me about Georgia O'Keefe and Alfred Stiglitz I, that's what American Romance was based on but now that oh. I I realize it was really about us because he and I were in a way a couple that never really were a couple in public but we were and so uh, American Romance was like that. But Alfred Stiglitz and Georgia O'Keeffe inspired it to begin with. So sometimes you write on levels and you don't realize it until the song is done. Mm, I see. And would you play a thing, thing for him? Was it like, I mean, I picture like uh, uh, Lillian Hellman and Dashiell Hammett, you know, from the movie Julia, you know, where she would write a play and then show it to him and he'd go, no, take it back. <laughs> until she threw the typewriter out the window. But well, that's was funny. He that no. kind of a, a, was it that no, or no? No, he he, he, he would just give you the 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 yeah the and mojo, he, the energy. He really loved the, what I was doing, and, and that mm -hmm. you know you feed a dog a cookie, he'll do what he was doing when you gave him the cookie. You know you don't beat the dog. So I loved working with him because he just so believed in what I was doing, mm -hmm. and I just kept doing it. We made two albums together, and rightly so, rightly so that he believed in got and got you back on track in your yes end. yes and then you made this beautiful album then you then you made rosebud right and then you made american romance oh yeah american romance came first and then rosebud yeah the great great albums i mean great albums Thank singer you. songwriter albums that were like joni mitchell and are like oh. these things because they're real they're real things the from your lips say the god's ears for god that's right all right, you doing okay? We still. I am. I'm doing fine. Okay, I got a little more for you. And uh, you wrote musicals, stage musicals. You wrote. I know you wrote one with the great uh, actress Diane Ladd. And 
And uh, oh yeah, I did write the words and music to that. I'd forgotten. Yes, you did, and you wrote uh, film songs uh, re relatively recently for Henry Henry Jaglum. Oh yeah, you know, the great film director. So you've you've written dramatic things for dramatic vehicles. And well, uh, what is the difference uh, between writing a song for the pop format about a character in your head or yourself? versus writing for a scene, a situation, and a character on a page that someone gives you? What's your process there? Well, what I do is I usually try to find what I have in common with that character so I can write, I can be behind my own camera instead of trying thinking, well, who, what would he say? So when I had to write the love theme song for the Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon, I thought, what do I have in common with a young African-American male who is a virgin and into Kung Fu who lives in the ghetto. Well, that's your life, though. That's, that's yeah. you. You live that life. So what's the big deal? So I thought, well, he's falling in love with someone played by vanity. You know, he's falling in love for the first time. I remember I did that. And so let me just write about that. So then I wrote First Time on a Fair as well. And then when I co-wrote all the songs for The New Adventures of Pippi Longstocking, I thought, what do I have in common with a red-haired girl who lives alone with a horse and a monkey? Well, uh, she's really independent. I was raised very independent, and she thinks she can do anything. I was one of those. So I wrote from that viewpoint because we both had that in common. So it's different in that you are a character, and sometimes I'm even less like the characters. But that's just the lyric. I mean, musically, like for Henry Jaglum, he uh, had me write songs for a movie called Irene in Time. First of all, my whole band is in the movie. He, he heard my band, and he decided to make a movie kind of like a lucky man where the band... Yeah comments on the action wow. and so he used a lot of songs i had already written but we recorded them in the movie and then i wrote a song for the movie uh because she's looking for her father in all these men she's dating well i could sure relate to that so i i wrote a song called searching for you and that's for the movie but all the others were already written so when I was writing with some guys from Nashville, I said, how do you write and not put the audience to sleep when you're performing with no pictures to conflict with the pictures on the screen? How can you write a decent song that also doesn't conflict with the movie? And they said, well, we usually put the pictures in the verse because they're going to put the chorus in the movie because that's the big emotional part. And I thought, well, okay, I can do that. Yeah. But 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 you're not but you you're not you don't want to comment on what they're already seeing. You're no. already seeing something, so you don't want to say what they're seeing. So right. Do you want to say something else that sort of gives more reality and uh, and wisdom to what's going on upstate on the state on the uh, yeah. Screen, right? And you can't say things like blue shirt, and you know you can't be that specific in the chorus. Right. Not not that I would anyway, but I see. So all right, but so these these songs are about you anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, they mine. were like, okay, you win. It's in the movie and Starbucks and all these songs. That I, he just wanted to use them in the movie, yeah. but somehow it comments on the action. And sometimes well, got, it's just in the background. I see. You got this. I want to I just listen to this title, everybody. This is one of her titles, and it's a great song. And it goes, okay, you win. I give up. You're right. I'm gone. <laughs> That's the title. Okay, you win. I give up. You're right. I'm gone. Uh -huh. Is that awesome or what? How uh, important are titles to you, just generally? Well, they're real important. I, I actually had a student named Janelle Rapp who was writing uh, something to someone, and the title she came up with was, Okay, You Win, I Give Up. And I thought that was already a song, so I, I added, you're right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right, I'm gone. And um, then I wrote the rest of the melody and lyrics to that. Sure. But uh, titles, I think, are real important. I, um, 
I think, you know, not to know what your title is, is like getting in the car, wanting to go to New York, but you just start driving. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Wow. And is the title come like when McCartney wrote yesterday and he <laughs> dreamt scrambled eggs? And, yeah. And, and, uh, and how to find what is it about and what says that what it's about? And the, the answer is the word yesterday. Mm -hmm. My trouble seems so far away. So, so at what point are you are you searching for that that uh, steering wheel to New York uh, right from the get go? When you start, well, let's say I uh, had dreamt scrambled eggs. I would have to have a three syllable word with that rhythm because he had the melody already. You know, right. so to have a hook, in other words, the melody and lyric of the title, is real important. So. Um, but the truth is, when I start writing, I sit down and start writing a verse. And once I have the emotion to get that melody to the title and the chorus, if I'm writing a chorus song, right. uh, it comes from the feeling I get from the verse. Now, I don't advise that. I don't have my students do that. They write from right. a title. Right. Well, that's because that's a bit dangerous because you can go, this is great. This is great. I'm at a brick wall. There is no way out. I'm in a corner at a brick wall and I just went the wrong way. I didn't know where I was going. Like you said so beautifully, it's how do you drive? Where am mm -hmm. I going? Yeah. Well, but but then there are all kinds of ways to do it, right? Yeah. All I'm kinds sure. of ways. People say, ask me, what do you write? Lyrics first and music first? And, it's like, and the answer is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever, <laughs> whatever is available, I grab it, you know. So what is your viewpoint about art and artists and what their role is in the world or in the civilization. What are they for? I think the artist, I, I, I'm going to quote Chick Corea here because what he said was communication is the single most important thing in art. And even though what he wrote was way above my pay grade. I couldn't even find the chord he was playing, but I never felt not communicated to. I always felt included because he was a master communicator. So I feel that it is my job and every artist's job, even painters, to communicate. Now, maybe you won't communicate to everyone. Maybe you only have your target audience to communicate to. But when those people hear what you have to say or see your painting or see your acting job, they feel less alone, like, oh, someone else feels like that. Mm -hmm. And that makes them feel better. So when I have a concert, it doesn't matter how down someone may go and they may be crying and everything else, but they're crying from a realization and then that I lift them up. That's my purpose to lift them up in the world so that one, that not only do they not feel so alone, but they they see the world in a more positive way because heaven knows we need that now, and, but not by being preached to. Please don't preach to me. And I tell my students, no, no, you can't preach. That's that's off limits. Well, what you do, what you do is you express you express your humanity on the stage. I've seen you perform many, many times. And that's what you do so brilliantly is uh, you are you and you and you allow yourself to be you. You take that stage. You say whatever you want to say any <laughs> old time. And you and you're never the same. You're always right where you are, right in the present. And there's something very therapeutic about being with someone who's actually there. It's like actual real life communication. It's oh. not just your it's not just you've got something pat in your head, you know. Uh, you know, well, this next song is you're just there and you want to say something and you say it. And that alone makes people, I think, makes people realize what life it really is, which is alive, which is right now. And you demonstrate this. That is such a beautiful thing to say. Thank you so much. Well, you you <laughs> do it. You do it. And so that's so. But I get what you said about art in general and our friend Chick Corea. We, we both are were dear friends with Chick Corea and uh, he was a genius and it's interesting for all of his ability and for all of his deep training and creative 
wow, you know, that his, his ability was, uh, he was a master, and that word is thrown around, he was uh, a master. There was yeah. nobody who could do what he did, but his, what, but what you said is what his point was. Yes. He always communicates, he's communicating. I saw him do something recently. I saw him perform about three months ago in Florida. Um, um, Chick Corea, by the way, is, is, a, is a master jazz uh, pianist, composer, who won 23 Grammys and blew the world away with his genius. I saw him do something. He called someone out of the audience and he sat them in a chair in the middle of his show. And he said, okay, I'm gonna do a little portrait of you in music. And we all went, what? What's he gonna do? Oh, what? He had him sit in the chair, he looked at them in the eyes and, he, and his hands went and he started to play and duplicate and be exactly who they were in music. <sighs> and it was all the things you might imagine it, it would be. It was this astonishing, stunning, stu stunning, singular. You've never seen anything like it. And, uh, and, but here's the deal. One, by, one for one, he did it three times. Um, there was one a very pretty woman who was very sort of together and she had, uh, you know, her, she was well dressed and, and she together, you know, kind of cool young chick, you know, and she sits down, he sits down and he starts to play this frenetic music. Oh. And we're all, I, I felt a little embarrassed because I'm thinking, oh my God, he's missing it. He's missing her. He's not getting it. And I'm noticing the smile on her face starts to grow as she's sitting there. He got exactly what was going on with her that wow. needed the facade. He got her. And he did wow. it three times. At, yeah. So communication is the name of the game. You get somebody alive right in front of you and you have something to say and they receive it and they feel that they're in life. And that is what an artist should do. I agree with you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for telling me that. Yes, isn't that something? Oh. Chick Corea, what a guy, what a, what a being. He'll be back. Um, yeah. So with this uh, writing stuff, do you ever get tired of it and want to do something else? <laughs> oh, no, I have so many activities. I mean, first of all, I teach and I act and I do a lot of things and I perform. When I'm performing, I think I'd rather do this than anything. But then when I'm writing, I think, oh, no, this is my favorite thing. So I'm an Aquarius. I don't know if, if any of that is true, but they say we like variation. And I do a lot of different things. And whenever I'm doing that, I think that's my favorite thing. You know, like when I'm teaching a class, anything, anything, you know. About when you're in the recording studio. Is that like? Oh, I love oh, that. Too. Isn't that good? <laughs> that is good. And when you hear the bass and drums thump, thump through those big speakers back at you and you go, oh, I know we just played. Yeah. It's really great. So you would just, but you would keep doing music till the oh. day it's over. Oh yeah. There's well, I mean, else. when oh, Helen wow, read... open a boutique, like a, a like a, a, a boutique for, with purses and jewelry and stuff. No. You know, when people say, "Are oh, you're still writing songs. I, I feel like <laughs> saying, no, I've become a plumber. What do you think I'm doing? That's what I've done for 40 years for a living. Of course, I'm still right. But, you know, people say that. And I mentioned it to my friend Andrea, you know, who sits back up with me. And she said, well, it's just that, you know, a lot of people have given up their dream. I said, yeah, but they don't do it. It's not their job. You know, I don't know. I, I find it very strange for anyone to say that to someone who's a songwriter. And, you know, when Helen Reddy retired, she said, I've given them 50 years of my life. That's enough, you know. Meanwhile, she came back and did a tour. But at the time, she thought she was retiring. And she said, you and my sister, my sister will be die on stage hitting a high note. You know, you songwriters, you just keep doing it. I thought, yeah. <laughs> That's too funny. So you're not going to be you're not going to be in the pool on the on the raft. Drinking pina coladas, <laughs> maybe and complaining between, and complaining between songs, but I won't be complaining. Yeah. And uh, here's here's something I'd like to know, given who you are. If you didn't, maybe next time around, 
if you were to come back next time, uh -huh. what would you want to be doing if it, were, if it wasn't music? What would you like to do? What interests you like that? Anything? Uh, I, I really love films. And I, I said to Henry Jaglin one time, who said he was only a filmmaker because he couldn't write songs. I said, I'm only a songwriter because I don't pick films. Wow. I would probably be a filmmaker. I love film. Wow. Wow. I can see you doing that. Which brings <laughs> me to a point where uh, you've got a film coming out about your life. Oh, well, that's right. And you do. And, and I, I don't have one of those. How did well, you get one of those? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that it's coming out. It hasn't even been shot. But what happened was I was performing at the coffee gallery backstage and Tom Solari was in the audience. and He's known my work for years, but it occurred to him that he should make this film about me based around a show of mine. So he decided at the beginning of the quarantine to go on Indiegogo and raise money for it. So amazingly enough, he raised the first phase of the money. Tom's a great director and he's very, no. very clever, smart guy. So mm -hmm. can't wait to see that. Me that's too. Great. And that's, and that's well-deserved. Thank well, you. Well, is there anything you'd like to say before we end up? So here they are, here's all our viewers and they're, watching you and uh, you've got, you know, like in the end of the Ten Commandments, when they're, when they're at the Red Sea and all the Israelites are there and Moses gets up on a rock and he goes, quiet, and they all go, Whoosh. and they turn. Uh, that's, that's this great. moment. What would, I just, what would you like to say to people well, about, I, about art or about anything at all? I am excited about something I'm doing right now that is a little off the beaten path, and that is I am creating a course that does not require my intervention. In other words, I've been teaching songwriting since 1986, when they called me in 1985 from USC and said I had to teach it, and I said it can't be taught, and then 1986 they called me back. And I said, okay. And then a few years later, I started teaching other places and on my own and stuff. And I did come up with a step-by-step -step approach that is pretty amazing, but mm -hmm. it requires my feedback on the steps. So I thought maybe I should create a course that doesn't require any feedback from me and I can have my students take it or anybody who's just interested to hear what I might have to say. It's called, strangely enough, and, and we didn't confer on this, it's called Getting Emotional Impact Into Your Songs. Wow. And it's just a series of videos and articles and stuff. And But it's on this platform called Thinkific, which is like teachable but harder to pronounce. <laughs> it's Thinkific, and I'm I'm almost done. I'm so excited, you know. And Andre, Huh? Yeah, That's Andre. Is, so you, won't have, you wouldn't have to be there or anything? No, I can just... Put it for sale and people, you know, and I, I, I'm not having discussion groups. I don't want to get into all that. Right. But it'd be interesting. So I've never done anything like that before. So it that's a whole new thing. I'm mean, just the technology of it has been, oh, my God. But their support is great. So That's great. Well, if there's anybody going to study with any anyone about songwriting, you are the one no, that they should go to. And that's the truth. You're one of those people that walks the walk. You know what you're talking about. And your purpose, as you said before, is to uh, inspire them and to make them better. And if that comes out in their songs, all the better. But uh, well, well, you really do. Harriet, thank you so much. We have, we have, I have so much more to talk to you about. Maybe we can do this again. I would uh, love that. I would love that. I just want you to know that on my teaching page on my website, at the top of it, it's a quote from you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, then that's very. You should go there that and makes, <laughs> Then that makes it. Uh, I said that. <laughs> no, you said it. But thank you. What is the uh, teaching page uh, website address? Oh, it's just harrietshock.com, and then you go to teaching and you can go to it. Okay. But um, they have to spell my name, and it's S C H O C K. And right. it's Harriet, I-E-T. People are starting calling it Harriet, like the Marriott Hotel, but it's not. <laughs> the Harriet Hotel.
<laughs> Harriet, thank you so much. There's also so many songs that I wanted to share with uh, the viewers today and uh, we didn't have time for. Um, and I'll just state a few of them as we okay. wrap up. Uh, you Are, uh, uh, Hers, which is about your sister and uh, it's a masterwork. Um, and uh, American Romance, Dancing With My Father, It Flies, and the others that you've heard, and the many, many hundreds of gorgeous pieces of work that Harriet has produced. So Harriet, thank you very, thank very you. much. Thank you. This is such a wonderful interview, and thank you so much for making me a part of your series. Well, it's an honor, truly. Uh, this has been a joy, and uh, we look forward to, this is what it says here, uh, we look forward to many, oh, to so many more of your creations in, year, in years to come. And that's the truth. We look forward to more and more and more from you. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. So here's another example of uh, Harriet Schock's genius. If we're going to be children for the rest of our lives, why then pretend to be husbands and wives? And if we're going to be blinded by the tiniest light, why not admit that we prefer the night? Do we take out our toys, swords, and guns? Or put out the white flag and run? Shining armor, and I wonder sometimes if you know all you are. You are the air, this drowning fool's last drowning fool's last. It's the perfect love song, Harriet. Thank you. What a great uh, thing you have going here. And, and you were so good. So think how, you know, you're going to have so much fun. I just loved nice. doing this. Thank you so Thank you much. much. All right. I'm in touch. Okay. Love you. Yeah, love you too. We all love you. Bye-bye. So that wraps up this edition of Song Sessions. Be with us next time. And we'll be spending more quality time with another master songwriter, and until then, for all our fellow artists who stay up burning the midnight or mid-morning oil, as the case may be, keep making beautiful things for us. Lord knows the world needs you more than ever. Boy, is that the truth. Bye-bye for now, and we'll see you next time for Song Sessions. Take care. Thank you.